Do you ever feel frustrated because you do everything right in the field and then you come home and your photos just don't look quite like the ones that you see on the internet or in books and magazines? In today's episode, we're going to talk about the methods that we follow to try to get the best possible images when we're out in the field. So, Jan. You certainly have a very distinct style to the images that you present. So what is it that you're trying to create and what are the steps in the field that you take and also maybe not just in the field to get those final beautiful shots? For me, it's definitely a mix of things. It starts in the field with going out with a vision to know what I want to take and following certain steps in the field. And a big part of my style is also editing. I enjoy editing. I like getting the most out of my images. So this is something that I follow up when I'm at home to get the images to look like exactly how I envisioned them to look like in the field. Well, and I think you said something really interesting there, which was that you have a vision. And this is one thing that I think sometimes a lot of people, when they head out into the field, they go out and they don't really have a plan in mind. So we've talked about this a little bit in the show before, but I know that both of us follow you know, this mindset where it's it's very rare that I leave the house with my camera and I don't kind of know what I'm trying to photograph and I don't have a plan in mind for wh what I'm trying to do. So I think that might be tip one this week on the show is have a vision, have a goal, have a plan and know it, what it is that you're trying to create before you even go out into the field. And I think having a goal or plan can also mean to just go out and have fun in the field. We don't always have to follow a certain strategy or want to take the best image ever. We can also just have fun in the field. But if you want to take those higher class images, those better looking images, then having a plan and following it and sticking to it is definitely a good idea in the field. So ultimately in the field though, we need to come home with a good high quality raw image. How are we going to do that yet? First of all, you need to master your camera and basically be able to use it blindly. You want to be able to change all the settings on your camera without actually having to look at the camera. If you have to look at your camera, chances are the birds are long gone before you actually change your settings. And secondly, it's very important that you learn to find the birds in the viewfinder really quickly. It sounds easy, but it's actually quite hard. So this is a skill that you really need to learn in the field. And I think you probably noticed the same thing on some of your workshops where it just takes people a little bit too long to find a bird in the viewfinder. And by the time they actually find it, the bird's long gone. For sure. And especially with the newer mirrorless cameras, it actually can be harder. It's one of the few things that the mirrorless cameras are maybe not quite as good at as the older DSLRs is that if you, if you go to the background, the, the camera's potentially not going to hunt for the subject. So being in the right focal plane and finding the bird, that's a great start. Now, what about settings, Jan? You know, obviously every scenario is different, but what are some typical kind of bird photography settings? If I'm photographing a perch bird, I definitely want to have like a four hundredth of a second as my minimum sort of shutter speed. That allows me to have just enough shutter speed to kind of freeze most of the movement. If the bird's moving more, I probably want a higher shutter speed, but a 400 of a second is really sort of my minimum. Below that, you're really getting into that camera shake territory and that motion blur territory. For instance, if the bird's singing, you see the beaks is moving and it's just not as nice anymore. And you have a lot less keepers if you're shooting below a 400th of a second. Another thing I want to say here is don't be afraid of high ISO anymore. There's such great software that can easily clean up 3200 ISO, 6400 ISO, that there's really no reason to shoot at like lower ISOs and lower shutter speeds, but rather pump up that ISO to get fast enough shutter speeds because you know the files will clean up nicely afterwards and you get better overall images. Well, those are some great tips for birds that are sitting on a perch. But what about birds in flight? I don't know about you, but I always find when it comes to birds flying, ideally, I kind of want to be more like a two thousandth of a second. And depending on the bird, you might even need to be faster than that. How about you? Definitely. I'd say for fast action, you probably want at least a four thousandth of a second. And it also depends whether you're panning with the bird or your stationary. If your camera is stationary, you definitely need really high shutter speeds to not have that sort of motion blow. Whereas if you're panning with the bird, you can get away with some slower shutter speeds as well. The next thing I think is super important and it sounds so obvious, but you want to put yourself in a position to succeed. I often say don't chase a bird that's basically impossible to get in your area. If you know you might be able to get a tame version of the same species 200 kilometers down the road, it's often a waste of time to try and chase a bird that just 
impossible to get because it's only high up in the canopy where you live, but somewhere else it's feeding from your hand. So putting yourself in a position to succeed with birds that are a bit tamer or birds you know you can work with, it's definitely important. Knowing when you have a good opportunity in front of you and knowing when to walk away, like the, what is it, Kenny Rogers, you got to know when to hold them, you got to know when to fold them, and you got to know when to walk away, and you got to know when to run. Yes, because if you walk away, you sometimes might get not the species that you wanted, but amazing photos of another species that actually is easier to photograph in that area. Another thing we absolutely need, though, is good light. We could have all the other things coming together, but if we're there at, you know, midday on a bright sunny day, that's not going to work out so well for us either, is it, Jan? Of course, the light is very important. Although, I always say there's no bad light, there's just bad editing, which is probably true to a degree, even though, of course, it's easier <laughs> to photograph with nice lights. If it's the middle of the day, harsh shadows, it's very hard to get something nice out of these photos, but generally speaking, don't be afraid of non-perfect conditions. You don't always have to have perfect sunlight to take great photos. Glenn and I actually prefer sort of overcast conditions, even dark overcast conditions, because it's so much easier to do setups because you can work more non-directional. You don't have to be afraid that some harsh sun shadow or harsh sunlight will kind of hit your setup and ruin all your photos. So with that dark overcast light, you're a lot more flexible and you can actually get some really nice photos. And personally, I definitely prefer the overcast conditions. And even when it's really dark, you don't have to be afraid and sort of pack up and go home. Like when I was photographing the rifle birds in the deep dark rainforest at ice or 20,000, a lot of people would have probably packed up. Whereas if you know what you're doing, know how to get the most out of these images, you can get some fantastic images, even in these really difficult and dark conditions. Now, you mentioned something there if you're doing a setup. Now, this is one area where I think is where sometimes certain people stand out above the crowd. It's so often that I'll show up at a lodge when I'm doing my workshops or something, and maybe there's already some people shooting, and you can just tell these perches have been there for days, weeks, months. There's nothing redeeming about them, and people are you know, the bar is quite low. People are happy to just get a sharp photo of a bird on a really nasty looking perch. And I think this is an area where, you know, both of us really try to elevate the game and, you know, spend the time to really do great quality setups. I think that's one area that really makes people stand out. Would you agree on? It's definitely an area where you can stand out. And I think it's important to remember that almost every shot you've ever seen on the internet is set up to some degree. All the National Geographic, all the David Attenborough videos, it's all set up. So this whole idea of you're walking through the forest, you have a perfect bird on a perfect perch with a perfect background and no one has touched anything, it's quite romantic, but it's not necessarily yeah, one, the reality. One, like, one there's percent, a lot of one percent tricks. of your photos, maybe. Totally. So there's exactly this a bit of trickery is usually going on and setups for me have been a great way to kind of stand out. And I think especially with bird photos where you have an out of focus background and a bird, the perch is the third very important element. So if that's just one straight boring stick, you're not getting the most out of your photo. Whereas if you have some amazing branch that has lots of little leaves and coming out from different angles, you can really elevate your images to stand out amongst the crowd. Absolutely. And if you guys are interested, Jan has a video called Perched. You can check that out where he talks all about how he selects the right perches for the right job. So you can always check that out. Now, one other thing, the sort of X factor here that I want to talk about, the willingness, the determination, the ability to spend hours in the field and not succeed, but you have a vision, you have that goal, you know the quality and the caliber of image you're trying to create and you're relentlessly in pursuit of it until you find it. And Glenn is actually the best example of it because when he came to Australia twice, within like two or three weeks, he probably creates a better portfolio than most Australians have because you are that determined. You grab your 600, you walk with that thing all day long through the streets trying to find different birds. I remember when I was so sick, I couldn't get out, but you grab... Hopefully, hopefully not Hopefully not through the streets. <laughs> <laughs> not just the streets, but... Actually there, for instance, you went out with your 600 millimeter lens, you found those thick birds feeding on a roundabout, you found the bee eaters in the middle of a field, you 
went out with my car one morning, you found this one spot where you got six or seven other species. So you definitely have that determination and the knowledge to get something in a completely new spot. So I think that really stood out to me. And I think it's a good example of knowing the birds and then having the willingness to find them and to sort of work and fight for it can really help you to separate you and stand out. And as you said, there's that's an interesting kind of memory, you know, going back to that trip, because you also have to know that it's not every shoot is going to be a successful shoot. And so many times you go out, you spend all that time, all those calories hiking <laughs> around with your gear and your shoulders getting sore and you come home with nothing. But the experience of knowing, you know, the conditions just weren't right. The birds just didn't cooperate, but you just keep going, you keep going, you keep going. And I find that on every kind of one of my personal shoots where I'll go somewhere for two, three, four weeks, there'll be that one day, that one day, magical day where everything works out and you get tons of good shots and you just you know, the weather's perfect the light is perfect the birds are cooperating and so just perseverance stay out there keep working hard and eventually you'll get the shot so another frustrating part for many people is we spend literally hundreds of hours in the field but we're only 50 percent there because we still need to edit our images and select the right photos to make the images truly stand out and get those amazing final results yeah i totally agree this is a super important to refine all of those hundreds thousands tens of thousands of photos that you took down to just the best ones that you'll then polish up and spend all that time in the digital darkroom so what is it that we're looking for well obviously you know there's certain elements that are gonna to come together to make a nice photo. We already talked about the perch. We've already talked about good light. I think obviously the settings lead to a properly exposed image. And one that often goes overlooked is the pose of the bird. So we want that eye contact, nice head turn, looking into the, the camera, because that creates that engagement, which while some people might think, oh, well this photo's kind of interesting because you can see the bird's tail feathers. Yeah, may maybe, but you know what? If the bird's looking completely the other way, it's it's probably not that interesting. So head turn, eye contact, I think that's really important. Definitely, I think the head turn is super important. And also if you have like two birds interacting, for instance, and they still look at the camera as well at the same time, that can be fantastic. I think the most important thing is really to have a plan also when it comes to editing and selecting the photos, because let's say you come home from a trip, you've taken 38,000 photos, you need to have an idea of what you're looking for when you're going through all these images or it's going to take you forever to go through them and you might end up keeping most of the files and that's not really what we want. Yeah, and there's different ways to do it. I am ruthless when it comes to culling. So I was just in Brazil a little bit ago, probably took 30,000 photos. I kept 200. And those other, you know, 29,900 and 800 photos, they're gone. I mean, I delete them. I don't keep any of those. However, some people don't want to do it that way. Another way to do it would be to make a, a subfolder like selects or best of the best or something and move the ones that you actually want to add it into there and keep them. I personally wouldn't recommend doing that because it's a lot of storage space, but however you get there, pick your best work, edit your best work to the best of your ability. And those are the ones you're going to share with the world. Yeah, I'm probably not that ruthless. Out of 30,000 images, I'll probably keep two to 3,000 at least, but also because I do all these educational videos and these YouTube videos, so I need some different poses, some bad he's poses, getting, so I'm not getting, that ruthless. But He's I getting wishy-washy, <laughs> folks. He's getting wishy-washy over there. Hey, look, you've picked the best of the best photos. Now, the next thing is we need to sit down at the computer and it's time to get going, but not so fast. Before you start editing those images, it's so important that you calibrate your monitor. Yes, definitely. Calibration is important. And if you don't want to do it for some reason, or just have a laptop, you're not quite sure how to do it. I think at the very least, you want to send your images after you edit them to a couple different devices to make sure they look all right on these different devices on your phone, for instance, mm. because this is where most people will probably see your photos anyways. However, the advantage of a calibrated workflow with a calibrated screen just like that is that you can be certain that the images that you see on your screen are perfect when it comes to the colors. And if you save them properly with the color profile attached as well, you know that the images you're sending off are perfectly fine. And in the end, you can't really influence what other people see on their screen anyways, because their screens could be totally out of whack. But if your own workflow is calibrated, at least you know that on your end, the images are perfect. Now we're ready to start doing some image editing. And just like in the field, it's so important to have a good plan, to have a vision. So I don't know about you, Jan, I bet you it's the same for you. 
you open an image and you look at it and there's a sort of pause, which might be a short pause or a longer pause, where you're thinking in your brain, okay, I'm going to do this, this, X, Y, Z, and you sort of start to formulate a plan for what you do and then you attack it. You do not just start randomly, oh, what if I slide this? Oh, what's this filter? No, don't do that. Find a good basic workflow that works for you and try to kind of work your way through that on most images and then make a plan for the things in the image that maybe you want to remove or enhance or work on. So we move from a global editing kind of plan down to a selective editing polishing step. Is that sort of how you go about things? Yes, I usually do the noise reduction first and the or Puro or Adobe Enhance. So I don't have any noise in the images anymore. Then I make the tweaks and camera raw with our pro sets or you can do the same in Lightroom as well to get the colors right. And then I open up the file in Photoshop and look at all the things that need to be changed. For instance, if there's anything to clone, are there some feathers that are not perfect that need to be tweaked a little bit, or are there areas that are too dark or too bright? And then I selectively work on all these areas with like curves or selective colors or the cloning to make sure I have a nice and even image. And then I start to do some global adjustments on the overall image to perfect the overall look. What you don't want to do is really only do global adjustment because it can be very hard to deal with tricky images then because let's say a bird has a very bright spot. If you're increasing the exposure, it will mean that that bright spot will blow out. Whereas if you do selective adjustment, you can layer mask out that bright spot and then increase the saturation or the brightness and then it doesn't affect that bright spot, but you can still overall brighten the image. So that's definitely the way to go with selective adjustments. Now, one area that sometimes people, trips people up is they kind of take it a step too far maybe. We often see images on Instagram or Facebook or wherever you look at images where it's really obvious that something's been cloned or maybe sometimes people do wacky stuff like they try to move the branch over here but they don't really they haven't really learned how to do it properly so it's super obvious. So don't do that. Don't don't go past your skill set and try to do stuff that's not going to look natural. You need to look at it and honestly be able to assess does this look natural or is this super obvious? Whenever I'm doing any kind of cloning or anything, I always do it on a separate layer. And before I kind of flatten things down, I'll you know toggle the visibility of that layer on and off. And oftentimes you'll see a little artifact or something, oh, I gotta do a little more work there, fix that up. And only once I feel as though there's absolutely no way that anybody would ever notice that I've removed something, am I happy enough to flatten the image down and, and save the file. So you know, be careful of over-processing as well. See, that's another area where we differ because I never ever flatten any of my files so I can go back in a year from now and make sure if there's anything wrong in the file, I can still change it. But of course, it also means my files are much larger than yours and you won't need as many hard drives as I have. <laughs> Yan, Yan is, Yan is single-handedly supporting b &H photo video just in hard drive purchases these days. So there is no one way to do this. There's not one correct way to edit your files. You want to keep all your layers? By all means. You want to flatten your layers? That's fine too. But you definitely need to work your way towards building up your skill set so that you can make your images look how you dream they should look, how you want them to look. And if you want to do that, we have some resources for you. You can check out my ebooks, you can check out Jan's masterclass, and if you want to speed yourself up in the raw processing, you definitely want to check out our pro sets. Definitely. I think it's important what you're saying. If you do something, you need to know why you're doing. So if you decide to flatten your images, that's fine because you like to flatten your images. Mm -hmm. I like to keep my layers. It's just important to have that plan and follow it through and not do just random things where you don't really know why you're doing them. So we want to learn to take better pictures in the field. We want to learn more about image editing. What can we do about it? What do you think are some key elements to improve your skills as a bird photographer, Jan? Learn all the field craft, learn about the bird courts, learn about the birds, learn about finding the right spots, master your camera, learn how to find a bird in the viewfinder, all those things in the field. And then secondly, it's also very important to master the editing. With modern mirrorless cameras, it's actually fairly easy to take good enough images in the field. If you have a great camera, you find some tame birds, chances are you will get away with some nice images. But if you then don't know how to edit them to make them pop and stand out, you'll never quite get the results you're truly after. And I think editing is actually one area where most people can improve the most. We all take great images in the field, but not knowing how to get the most out of them is where a lot of people kind of fall short. So learning the editing side of things is very important and can make you stand out the most in the quickest way. 
And another way, obviously, if you're wanting to sort of really level up your photography game or just go to some cool places and learn from some other people, spend time around other photographers, obviously I'm biased as I lead many workshops throughout the year, but taking workshops can be a great way to improve your skills, get some great shots, have a good time, make some new friends. It can be a really fun and educational way to enhance your skills. And I did that back in like 2006 or 2007. I went to a workshop of someone that I really admired and I learned a lot in just two or three days. These people have so much experience. So even to this day, I can still kind of grab things from that workshop that I remember and use it in the field. So for me, that was definitely a worthwhile investment. All right, and with that said, hopefully you found some good tips there to take your images to the next level. And some people who've already taken their images to the next level are gonna be featured in this week's photo of the week. So Jan, what's the first image you've brought for us? The first image I brought is of these two beautiful blue-breasted fairy wrens from Dryandra in Western Australia by Darren Stevens Photography. And I thought it's just a beautiful shot. The birds are really nice. They're looking at each other. Their tails are in focus. They're nice and upright. The perch is also quite decent. There's just one thing I'm not entirely happy in this image. And I wonder if you can guess what that would be, Glenn. Okay. I like, I like this game. Um, so I think I know what you're going to say. I think you're going to say that the perch is too flat and too horizontal. Is that it? Oh no, I can actually live with the perch. If it was too upright, I think the birds wouldn't sit as nicely on it. What I was thinking is actually the sort of okay. very monotone colored cream sort of colored background. There's some nice grasses at the bottom that you can't really see also because they're kind of the same color. So I would have probably tried to kind of either brighten the background or use like a selective color layer to kind of shift the color away a bit so it doesn't feel so heavy in that sort of brown, yellow, cream color. Okay, so my first image this week is by Birds by KSW, and it's of this really cool species, the Razorbill. It's got some food, some little fish in its bill. I assume it's in Iceland. Um, and just a really, a really pleasing, nice portrait of this species. There's a few things I would consider changing, but what do you think about this image, John? I think it's a really nice image. It's not as common to see these razor bills with a beak full of fish compared to like a puffin, for instance. So I think it's a very unique shot. There's one thing I'm not too happy with, which is probably the crop, because you see the kind of wing at the bottom of the image, which kind of ruins the flow a little bit for me because there's such a nice line coming from the beak all the way down to the throat of the bird to the edge of the bird. And if you crop that image differently, that line could end up right in the corner of your frame, giving your image a really nice flow. But by the inclusion of the wing at the moment, it feels like there's a little bit of a different shape and it's kind of disrupting the flow for me a little bit. So I'll probably change the crop a little bit where I move it up a bit higher, maybe a little bit wider to just give the bird more breathing room, but also better flow in the image. First of all, I agree with you. I'm not convinced of the crop. I think it doesn't need to be that long. The bird feels a little tight to the top of the frame to me. Um, the background, I wonder if you could saturate it more and bring out a bit of the blue. And then the other final thing was because the bird, it does have a nice head angle and it's slightly turned towards us. However, the photographer was quite close with a long lens here. And I wonder if they had the light to stop down a bit, because it looks to me like the bill is actually a little bit out of focus. And I wonder if they could have got a little more depth of field and created a little bit of a crisper, totally in focus, in focus shot. So it's a really cool shot, but it's these fine points, just like we've been talking about in this episode, to get your images up to that next level, it's these fine details that, that actually add up to, to the final, final, final wow shots. My second image is of this Easter Meadowlark in flight, and I think it's just a really cool shot. It's a great flight pose. The bird's kind of looking at me, beautiful background, beautiful light. There's really nothing I don't like of this image. So very well done, my bird's gallery. You always feel really lucky when you're doing flight shooting and you get a head turn because so, so often you get super perpendicular. And that's, you, you know, for a flight shot, you kind of accept that. But when you get a bit of a head turn, that's like an extra bonus on a flight shoot. And, and I think, you know, you mentioned it's in a perfect, perfect world, maybe the wings would be slightly more down. But also this is kind of how these birds fly. They don't really, like this bird was probably kind of coming in for landing and it wasn't full on flapping like that. So that's why the birds are probably there. So I think it's a really, really nice shot. All right, the next image that I've brought this week is by Hara Prasanyak, 
and it's the obligatory Glenn picked a sunbird this week because I love those sunbirds. And this one is a gold sunbird. And I just think it's a really, a really cool species on a quite a nice perch. Now, this is one where for me, I think a little bit of some editing tweaks, probably from the raw stage, could have enhanced this image. So what do you think, Jan, about the processing of this file? This could be an image where you even use two raw files trying to tame those highlights, like one brighter one, one darker one, and then merge the two together to make sure that you're not blowing out too many of the highlights, because this is definitely, for me, I think that's what you're thinking as well in this image. It's just too bright. There's a lot of very bright areas in this image. The bird itself is probably all right, but everything else is quite bright. The background's all right, but especially those flowers in the brighter branches definitely need some toning yeah. down. And I'm not even entirely sure if I would crop this image like that or if I go in a little bit tighter. Exactly. I think you could go tighter on the crop and overall, as presented, it's too much contrast. So we need to tone that down a bit, basically. And as Jan said, one way to do that would be to double process the raw, you know, deal with the highlights in one, overlay them, layer mask that in. Another option, um, you know, would have just been if you had the latitude in the one file to just really work on holding on to those highlights. But it's a gr we've got the great raw image here. It's just the image editing that that needs a little bit of work to to make this file be the best it could possibly be. All right, and this last image is interesting because your third image is also my third image, Glenn. We both picked the Flame Robin by yep. Gus's Gallery. And <laughs> so there must have been something that we both liked about the shot. And for me, there's a few things that I really like about the images. And then there's a few things that I'm not entirely sure about. What do you think those things are? And what would you change on the image, Glenn? <laughs> yeah, this game is fun. Um, so obviously, we both enjoyed this image. And there's so much to like about it. The perch is great, this sort of bushy perch that the bird is boop, right on top of. The pose is quite nice, could use a little more of a head turn in a perfect world, but I think what you're getting at is that maybe overall it's a little dark. And also, I think it's maybe doesn't need to be, and this is obviously objective, but maybe doesn't need to be quite that loose of a crop. I think you could crop in a little bit tighter and certainly need to boost the, the overall exposure of the image. And... In doing so, you're just going to need to hold on to the brightness of the reds and the whites on the bird just to make sure you don't overexpose those. But overall, the raw image here, the, the potential, it's a great one. And this is a great example of an image of what I talked about earlier where we have a bird that has some bright parts, but the overall image is too dark. And if you're only trying to do global adjustments here, like increasing the brightness, you're likely blowing out the orange and the bright wing patch. So if you learn selective editing where you can layer mask out the bright areas and then brighten the rest of the image, you'll end up with a more pleasing looking image because you can brighten the background, for instance, which I think is a little bit too dark in this shot. But overall, a fantastic image, and I just love that small, bright orange bird on that bluish perch, overall really nicely done. All right, guys, well, that does it for this week. I hope you've picked up a few tips on how to take your images to the next level. We hope you enjoyed the show. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, and we'll see you in the next episode. See ya.